me go ahead and share my screen. Um, Stacy, I assume you will let me know if my audio gets funky, um, but hopefully we'll do good. So, and I, you should all be seeing a slide that says, has GetOps hit an inflection point? Okay, excellent. So let's launch in. I think this is a great question. So um, the term GitOps was coined, as you heard from Alexis, at, um, the, coin, the term has been kind of working its way through the industry for, gosh, probably four years now, um, at least three, if not four years. And so I think it's a reasonable time for us to kind of look back and say, what has happened so far? And have we hit this point where we have kind of We've hit a tipping point. We've hit an inflection point. And uh, spoiler alert, I think we have, um, but let me share with you uh, my thoughts on that. So um, let's go on a little journey. And I'm not going to start with GitOps. I'm going to start with something else. I'm going to start with cloud native software. So when we think about that cloud native software, I'm naturally going to start here. That is with the monolith. Yes, I'm going back several decades, and this is the way that we used to build software. I've been doing this for quite some time, so I took software engineering courses 30 years ago in university, where we were taught practices on how to manage these very large systems. So that's kind of where, where at least my world um, in, uh, in computing began. Now we built those monolithic systems for quite some time. And then we started to recognize what some of the challenges were with these large, very heavy systems that were hard to change and, and even hard to reuse certain parts of that application. So the term service-oriented architecture, and now I need to go over here, yep. The term service-oriented architecture came along. And the open group, which was, if you will, a bit of a monolithic um, software engineering or, uh, or monolithic kind of standards body, use, define service-oriented architectures this way. A service-oriented architecture is an architectural style that supports service orientation, which I just think is hilarious because it's one of those definitions that when you look up a word in the dictionary, it tells you that the word means and it uses the word to define that. So I have no idea what this means. But for those of you who were along, along the ride with me, what this effectively meant was that we started to try to at least break up interfaces. So we put a little bit more attention on putting an interface that allowed me to call into the monolith from some external thing. Now, those of you who are with me also know that when it came to service-oriented architectures, it was a little bit like putting lipstick on the proverbial pig. Um, we put these service interfaces over the top, but everything still remained, remained extraordinarily brittle. Um, I, the service, services internal to the implementation at the back end. There were all sorts of couplings in the implementation at the back end, so I really didn't gain a whole lot of leverage from that. Now we had a couple of years where SOA um, really not, it, it really didn't um, deliver on the goals that we had with service oriented architecture. So we started with the monoliths, then SOA. And then what's, what's interesting is that that SOA model that I just talked about still kind of left this like core monolith in the middle. And then we had like these these little service endpoints that we circled around the sides. And what you see here is a diagram, pretty common diagram, famous diagram that you can find on the web, which talks about moving from these centralized architectures into more of a decentralized architecture, and then finally into a highly distributed system. Now, when I started my engineering um, education, distributed systems were very, very niche. A few people were experts in distributed systems, but it wasn't really broad knowledge. Of course, today, here we are 20 years plus into the internet, we all have become distributed systems engineers. And if you look at the trajectory of software engineering and the way that we built software over the course of these several decades, really this is what started to happen. 
It wasn't when we put service-oriented interfaces on top of the monolith that things changed. It was when we started to embrace this notion that we needed to do things differently in this more decentralized and then eventually distributed world. So if we go on with some of the trends in software engineering, the next trend that came up was representational state transfer. I first started talking about REST, and that's a picture of Roy Fielding, whose dissertation was on representational state transfer. He was one of the early people working on the web. Um, I, I started talking about REST during the height of the SOA um, craze. And I actually had people kind of like scoff at me when I started to bring up REST. But REST really bring a, a number of things. It bring using HTTP as the communication protocol instead of things like CORBA and these kind of like strange communication protocols. REST didn't require HTTP, but in practice, that's what people used. It also brought things like human readable payloads. So you started transferring XML and whether you love or hate XML, it definitely was something that was a leg up because I didn't need a tool to read it. I could just read what was going across the wire in a text editor. The, the, the pay payloads that were going you know, back and forth had hyperlinks to related resources. Now, when you think about related resources, think about the previous picture that I have. I'm now breaking up the monolith into a number of different related re resources. And what REST did was it started to give you, it started to use hyperlinks and it started to move toward this decentralized and then distributed world of the services that these REST interfaces were um, uh, fronting. But perhaps one of the most important things that REST did was that it started to define, it started to put into our vernacular, the concept of item potence. It started to say, hey, when you're in a distributed system, there's all sorts of ways that things can break. So you need to be very, very careful. Part of Roy Fielding's dissertation said that when you are using the HTTP verb of um, get, is it get, fetch, whatever it is, it's been so long. When I'm doing a, yeah, an HTTP get, that cannot create any side effects. And even when I do a put, which is a write operation, the put has to be item potent, which is to say that if it runs once or it runs 10,000 times. Okay, so what I was emphasizing here was item potence. And really what's important here is that item potence was the first place where we started to really embrace kind of distributed systems. Um, and started to recognize that there were a set of different patterns that we needed to pay attention to in this world of distributed systems. Okay, so then after REST, what happened next? Well, what happened next is we embraced microservices. This was probably about 10 years ago or so when companies like Netflix and Amazon and Jeff Bezos is very famous for rule number six, if you don't follow rules number one through five, which said it was all about services and loosely coupled services, rule number six was if you don't do these things, you're fired. So there was Amazon, there was Netflix. Netflix, I considered them the poster child of distributed systems and microservices for quite some, some years. And so we created, we, the industry moved into this microservices world. Now you see the microservices death get this like sinking feeling in your city in here. And so we started to have to, as an industry, come up with the patterns that allowed us to deal with this complexity. So just like item potence in REST, Um, uh, patterns that allowed us to work in this highly distributed world. And if you'll, per, if you'll forgive this self-serving um, comment for just a moment, I wrote a book on this. I wrote a book called Cloud Native Patterns, which goes through about 30 or so patterns that are there, like item potence. Item potence is one of those that helps us dis, uh, deal with these microservice architectures.
Now, it wasn't just these software architectural patterns, but we also started to have patterns for the way that we were going to move from the monolithic systems over into the microservices systems. And things like the strangler pattern, which gave us mechanisms for taking a monolith, grabbing a portion of that, leaving the monolith in place, but extracting a bit out of that monolith into a separate external microservice and then working on wiring those things back together using the patterns that you saw in the previous slide. So once again, to kind of sum up this, this journey that we've been on is it wasn't until we as an industry really embraced what was happening in the world, which is we were moving from architectures that allowed us to work in the monolith to architectures that required distributed systems that we had a change, a real marked change in the way that software was developed, the way that software ran, the resilience around it, and so on. And I like to characterize that as we finally embraced this notion that we are, our compute, we're doing our computing in a highly distributed scenario and one that is experiencing constant change. And it wasn't until we embraced that that we had a change. So looking across that then, let's review what I just talked about. We started with the monolith, and there we have things like J2E application servers, which that were themselves monolithic. Then we started to move over into SOA, and some of the patterns and practices that we put in place in technologies were things like enterprise service buses. Then we put a lot of effort into and in governance around canonical data models. Then as we moved into REST, we started having technology. So Spring Boot supported um, REST-based protocols. Then we also started to see API gateways really becoming used quite a bit, which is something that is, of course, important when we want to route between these various microservices. And then finally, when we moved over into the microservices world, we had all sorts of technologies and practices that were added. We had containerization that became completely democratized and completely usable by anybody through Docker. Then we have Kubernetes, which is helping us orchestrate all of those containers. Then we have the software architectural patterns like retries, circuit breakers, service discovery, and so on, and patterns for updating our software like the Strangler pattern. And so across this 30-year trajectory, I'm going to suggest that the inflection point came here. And I went through this entire um, uh, journey to draw parallels to where we are on this side. So what we talked about was, all right, that's cloud native software, but what about cloud native operations? And I'll be honest with you, cloud native operations lags behind the trajectory the inflection point on the software side, we probably hit about five years ago, four or five years ago. But on the operations side, we haven't hit it yet, although I'm gonna suggest that we're hitting it now. So let's do a very quick review of what's happened over the operations landscape in the last 30 years or so. Same time period that I just covered on the software side. Well, 30 years ago, everybody was running in their own data centers. So here you go. Here's my data center. We're talking about large organizations, especially. Um, small organizations maybe had a server sitting under a desk. And the way that we worked, though, when we had these large data centers from the de software development perspective is that developers did their work, they threw code over the wall, and then the operator was responsible for getting it running into that in that data center. Well, then maybe 15, 20 years ago, the cloud happened. So cloud service providers like AWS, Google Cloud, and Microsoft Azure came along and really did something very fundamental. They created an API for that infrastructure. They created a self-service API that the operator who used to have to wire things up in the data center could use to just obtain the capacity that they had. Now, was this an inflection point? Well, I'm going to suggest But here's the thing. 
While the operator had a self-service API, the developer didn't. The way that we wrote software and ran software in the large enterprise remained very much the same as it was before. The developer was still developing their code and throwing it over the wall and the operator was running it. Well, one of the things that organizations did then was they said, well, we're gonna start giving the developer, here we go, can you hear me? Okay, great. So what we're talking about now, so we the operator had self-service, the developer didn't. And so organizations said, well, I we're, we know how to solve this problem. We're gonna give the developer access, self-service access to these cloud services. So we're going to give the developer, the developer who doesn't have system admin experience, access to the infrastructure. What could go wrong, right? So this has not worked out particularly well. So we have to come up with a different idea. So if we take a look at this, realized that the operator here in using the cloud had a self-service interface, but there was an infrastructure operator, something like an AWS SRE, who was keeping that system up and running. And I'm gonna suggest that what we, what we need is a pattern that is a little bit similar, is that the operator now in the middle of the screen here is acting as an SRE for a platform that provides the right capabilities, not infrastructure capabilities, but the right capabilities to the developer. So the question here is, the developer wants some self-service, but what does that self-service interface look like? So this is a good point to introduce this notion. And this is something that in my previous life at Pivotal, we spent a lot of time talking about was this notion of a platform team and an application team. So instead of a developer and an operator, we have an application team and we have a platform team. That platform team who used to be known as the operator is now responsible for providing a platform to the application team. And what they are going to do is that they are going to provide self-service to that developer, but rather than self-service infrastructure, because the developer shouldn't be burdened with knowing everything about the infrastructure, they are given a self-service interface, a self-service operational interface. Now, this is a perfect time for me to jump squarely into GitOps. Now, this is after all GitOps days, and I haven't talked about GitOps yet. So let me very briefly go over a definition of GitOps. And I'm gonna build it up incrementally. We have a runtime environment. In that runtime environment, we want to run our software. Now that runtime environment here, I've depicted it as Kubernetes. It could be any runtime environment. And later on, I'll be talking at the very end of the day, I'm gonna be talking about different um, target runtime environments, but let's go with Kubernetes for now. Then over on the far left-hand side, I have my developers, my application team and my platform team who are by the way, developers as well. They're developers of the platform. And what they need to do is they need to operate their assets that are running in this production environment, in this runtime environment. And of course there's a lot of space in between. So I'm gonna fill that out for you. What GitOps does is it says, all right, let's leverage Git to store our desired state. So the runtime system is a reflection of the actual state. The, um, uh, the Git is holding the desired state. And here's the key. Remember that I said, what does the self-service interface look like? Well, the self-service interface becomes Git. It's the interface for operations. So anytime you wanna affect something into, in the running system, you're going to do so by applying something via Git. So that's the interface to operations. Now, when I make changes in that Git um, system using these Git interfaces, I'm gonna have some automation that is going to make it so. 
And the important thing with GitOps is that that automation is convergent. We are capitalizing on this pattern of actual state and desired state. Remember, we embraced distributed systems that are constantly changing. So that constant change is important for us to be able to adapt to. So we need these convergent systems. And then finally, we know that there are sometimes there's automation that may happen over in the runtime system that we want to make sure is reflected back in the actual state. So either we're going to we're going to reset the, the runtime system to what's in the in the Git repository, or we may want to reflect some changes that are legitimate changes back into the um, act, the desired state. All right. So let's look at that timeline. If we look at that timeline the same way we did earlier, again, it spans about 30 years. 30 years ago, we were definitely running our systems on-prem and we were using kind of a traditional dev development separate from operational model. So very traditional operational model. And in that world, we were using consoles. We used clicky, clicky consoles. That was definitely um, the way that things were used and still is used in a lot. Now, when the But because there was an API to infrastructure, that, if you will, was the birth of infrastructure as code. As soon as I had an API, I had the ability to write code against that API to start at least managing my infrastructure via a coding mechanism. Then we have more recently in the last 10 years or so made this transition over into this model of, well, we have an application team and a platform team and the platform team provides a self-service API, the appropriate self-service API to the app teams. And around that time was when the, this, the impact of um, these technologies and these patterns like Docker and Kubernetes, which you saw became part of the inflection, were really part of the inflection point on the software architecture side. But then we also really in the last five years, this notion of declarative configuration and convergent systems in the runtime. So Kubernetes popularized that really became popular. But that doesn't get us all the way to operations. There was still something that was missing. And that self-service operations took all of the things that we had with the good patterns around applications and platforms, and it added to it things like versioning and branching strategies that are not just there for development, but are there to serve operations. Convergent delivery, that's where something like Flux comes in, where that is a convergent system that is bridging between the Git repository that stores the declarative configuration and the runtime system that is implementing that system. And then there's the notion of something that I'm going to call GitOps automation. Now, this is a little bit of a preview. Please come back at 1220 today or stick around, better yet, stick around for the whole day. I'm going to talk a lot more about the GitOps automation. What we're talking about here is a way for you to program your GitOps so that when you make changes in your Git repository, you as a um, platform team or as an application team get to program what the automation looks like from Git all the way out to the running systems. And I'm going to show you some really cool technology that we've been working on. And I am going to suggest that right here is the inflection point. Now, it's not just my analysis that I'm going to use to, to, as a proof point to the fact that we're at an inflection point now, there's a lot more evidence out there. There is, Tomo mentioned it earlier in the pre-show already, in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, we have a GitOps working group. And in fact, we also have a sandbox project called Open GitOps. Open GitOps is a sandbox project in the CNCF that is going to be the home of a number of artifacts that are under development. 
artifacts that help to educate and inform and um, bring people on the GitOps journey, help them understand what are the practices, tools, and technologies that are available and, and how should they apply them so that they don't have to invent that themselves. So that's where the Open GitOps project is. And the GitOps working group is caring for that. So this is a CNCF project. When we launched this last um, late last year in 2020, we had over um, about 40 organizations uh, sign up to participate and 80 or so individuals. And so we're on a regular cadence and I invite you to join us in the GitOps working group and um, work on curating the assets that are going into the Open GitOps project. And the first of those assets, by the way, are a number of GitOps principles, which I won't talk about here, um, but I invite you to come have a look at those GitOps principles. They are available in the Git repository. Now, what would a Kubernetes related talk be without a tweet from Kelsey Hightower, who already a couple of years ago, not quite a couple of years ago, was talking about the value of GitOps and what he was seeing as the potential there. Now, I think we'd all agree that Kelsey Hightower is an innovator. And I'm gonna come back to the, the, like the hype cycle or the, the life cycle of technology in just a moment. So here was an early an, an, an innovator who was looking at GitOps two years ago. So have we hit the inflection point? Again, I'm suggesting that we have. We have so many events that are circling around GitOps now. GitOps Con ran with KubeCon um, a month or two ago. We've got GitOps days happening today and tomorrow. How great is that? And then we also, through the Continuous Delivery Foundation, have a GitOps Summit that's coming up as well. Um, another thing that I wanted to draw your attention to is that our beloved Gene Kim and his organization, IT Revolution. So the godfather of, of DevOps, if you will, um, not to take anything away from Andrew Clay Schaefer, who did such important work at the beginning, but these days it's Gene Kim with, with the books he's written and the community he's built is also talking about GitOps. So there's a blog post that you can find and there's a white paper that's coming out in October um, that I had the great fortune to work with some of these industry veterans on that will be published um, later uh, in the year. Then the CNCF, we have a number of projects. We have projects like Flux and Argo CD, both of whom are Argo CDs, a great Okay. Am I back? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, another thing of note is that if you go on Indeed.com and you do a search for GitOps, you're going to find over 500 job postings that mention GitOps. So if you remember, I talked about the Open GitOps um, Sandbox project. Well, what we want to do is make sure that you can get the skills you need to be able to respond to these job postings that are looking for GitOps expertise. So in conclusion, I wanna go back to the crossing the chasm, our little bell curve here. I talked about Kelsey. Kelsey's a visionary, an innovator. It's definitely on the left-hand side. We would like to think that we are here as well at WeaveWorks. But what's happening now with all of the evidence that I just showed you, is that I fundamentally believe that we are here. We are not on the steepest part of the curve. We are not at the top of the curve yet of the early adopters or the pragmatists, the way that it's shown here, but we have crossed the chasm. And what that means is that the responsibility then comes on us, us at WeaveWorks, us, all of the different talks that you're gonna see over the next couple of days, the responsibilities on us to not just make GitOps usable by the visionaries and the early adopters who are going to put in the work to come up with the patterns themselves, but instead we need to up our game and give better tools, even, even easier to use tools so that the masses that are in the, that represent the green portion of this can make their way into success with GitOps. So 
Finally, I'm going to conclude by just saying that I really believe that GitOps is a revolution in cloud native operations and that that is the, one of the main reasons that cloud native operations is going to hit a, a new stride. And with that, I thank you. I thank you especially for your patience with the, um, the problems that we're having with Zoom this morning.